and it is a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I would have come just for this, just so there's no doubt, but it was, uh, I was able to fit in some other things as well, but I would have come just for this. Um, and, you know, before I, uh, before I begin proper, um, I just want to uh, pay a, a personal tribute to, to Mike. Uh, this is the first time I've been here that he's retired. Uh, it takes some getting used to for, for, for those of us who were his former students and colleagues. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, I disagree with Mike on quite a number of things, uh, but they are important things. And so even when I don't think he's right, he's right to be concerned about those things. And that alone is extremely important. And also, I think he is, uh, has been a, a major asset for the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a whole uh, in his career. Uh, his book, Millennial Dilemmas, Dreams. Millennial Dreams and Dilemmas, uh, is actually one of the uh, most important texts in Adventist scholarship, uh, even though he's not an historian, it's an extremely important text in Adventist history because he reviews the ethical challenges and dilemmas that he looks at. He has an historical review of attitudes to each. And it is probably, I would guess, uh, one of the most cited uh, works of Adventist scholarship because it feeds into so many areas, um, not only of ethics, which is Mike's speciality and area of expertise, but Adventist history, Adventist ecclesiology, Adventist theology, Adventist church life. Um, so a major contribution to, to the church and to its scholarship. But also, of course, he taught here for, I think, approaching 40 years? Yeah, more, than. more than 40 years. I believe Mike is the longest serving ever member of staff at Newbold. But he didn't just serve time. He influenced countless students here. Uh, and in terms of influencing the doctoral projects chosen by a range of now distinguished Adventist scholars in their own right, his influence has been truly profound. And then as a colleague uh, and as a mentor, I would say to me, certainly also had a huge amount of influence. So I believe that uh, Mike is, a, is, is a, a huge loss for Newbold, but of course, um, no one is irreplaceable and I won't say that he's a loss to the church because now that he's retired, I hope he'll have even more time for writing and scholarship, his uh, sometimes provocative scholarship, but as I said, provocative about the right things and about the important things. So a loss for Newbold, but he continues to be uh, a, a treasure for the Adventist church in Britain and more generally. And may I say the book's available <laughs> <laughs> My title has changed slightly. You'll see that it's 1914, 19... Now, you might think, well, they just misheard that I said 1914, they put down 1940. Actually, I did email to, to, to Helen originally 1940. The reason I put 1914 is because it's just too much to, to, to cover. Um, and actually, I have a fair amount on the... Because it's necessary to understand the mindset of that Adventists brought when they came to Europe. So the periodization is probably quite wrong, more like something of um, circa 1850s to 1914. But I will, I do have at the end a kind of afterword about how things changed in my perception at the moment uh, from the First World War through to around 1950. Uh, that is an area that I think needs more research. And I would say that much of this is an area that it, it needs more research. Um, for those of you who are students and are looking for a postgraduate uh, project, Adventist history is not a subject that has been done to death, just the opposite. Uh, and most of the areas that I will talk about would profit by more historical research. But I ha do have a kind of tentative view um, of the overall trajectory, and I'll share that with you at the end of, for that period after 1914, but we'll look in particular at attitudes uh, in, this, in this time frame. First, you know, I, I want to highlight for you an interesting and massive demographic shift in the Seventh-day Adventist church in the last half century. This is just 1960 to 2000 end because I love round numbers, but the, the, what I'm about to show you would be the same if we ran it through to December 31, 2013. In 1960, and I'm wondering if I, might we have some of the lights off just to help with the, 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 the contrast. In 1960, you cannot see because of this, but the pie here doesn't quite come out. That's better. Thank you. You can see that 
North America, Europe and Australia accounted for 47% of the world church membership. Now, what the percentages were a little earlier, we'll be seeing later, but as, as late as 1960, 47% of church members were in North America, Australia and Europe. And one out of six Adventists was a European. If you had a village of 100 Seventh-day Adventists, 16 of them would be European. Now, if we go to the end of 2010, the membership had grown from 1.245 million to 16.92 million. And I may say, if you want to know the current, the most recent reported membership is 18.14 million as of the end of 2000. That should, sorry, I'm sorry, that should say 2013. But the most important thing is, is the shift in the demographics. You can see that North America, Australia, and Europe together are 12%. And Europeans are now have gone down from 16% of the world church to 3%. Now, the net numbers have increased, including in Europe. But the share has changed. I don't think, by the way, that this is a cause for regret. I would say, actually, praise God for this. Uh, because it shows the way that a church that was entirely in North American has become truly a worldwide church. But it is a very major shift. And part of what the world church is adjusting to at the present is the fact uh, that North Americans, Europeans, and Australians once not only could call the shots, but they did call the shots. And some might say that they should, because they were the predominant force. And now the world church is having to adjust to a stage where uh, perhaps people from those cultures still feel a right of ownership over the church, but they no longer really possess it. And so, as always, in dealing with this kind of situation, envisaging how might the church move forward in the 21st century, how might this church move forward in the 21st century, it is helpful, I think, to look to our past. I would say that I'm an historian, but I actually do believe it to be true. So, the issue of how the church managed in Europe, I think, is an especially interesting one. So were Advent, and so the, you know, the question proposed, Seventh-day Europeans, question mark, what we're driving at is, is the Seventh-day Adventist church, has it become authentically European, or does it remain an American import, or some might say an American <laughs> implant? If we were to say, were Seventh-day Amer Seventh Adventists Seventh-day Americans or Seventh-day Europeans thinking in Europe, I would say the answer is both, because I do believe what we see is a trajectory. Until the mid-1880s, and perhaps a little beyond, actually, I think Adventism in Europe was basically an American implant. But changing from the mid-1880s and increasingly from circa 1900, I do believe the denomination in Europe became authentically European. Perhaps not in every country, but over, as a whole, uh, I think actually you could say, yes, we were Seventh-day Europeans rather than just Americans operating in Europe. And yet it does seem to me that Adventists in Europe reverted to being in some sense Seventh-day Americans after the First World War. And we'll, I'll touch on that at the end. And yet there's no question but that European Adventism remains distinct uh, in ways that are both good and, in fact, not always good. But there's no question that Adventism in Europe is not simply as it is in America or, indeed, simply as it is in any other part of the world. It has distinctive features and characteristics. Um, I'm not going to dwell on those in my presentation, but I'm happy to you know, share my own thoughts about how it's distinct afterwards. But I think many of you will have your own view. To understand the experience of the church in Europe, it's important to understand the mental world from which Seventh-day Adventism emerged. And in particular, American attitudes to world Christianity. I want to share with you this quotation from a sermon preached in 1813 by a man called Edward Griffin, who was a Congregationalist minister in New England and also president of Brown University, a Congregationalist institution part of the famous Ivy League, one of the institu elite institutions in America. And he was reflecting about the state of religion in 1813. And he said, well, the church is now chiefly confined to two countries. 
Well, what he means is that the Protestant churches, because Roman Catholics for him didn't count, but still it's a somewhat pessimistic view. But in his view, the church is now chiefly confined to two countries, the United States and Great Britain. But he said, if the church is to rise in this day, if there is to be a revival of the church, where is it more likely to rise than in the United States? And if in the United States, where rather than in New England? Now, this sort of attitude was actually quite common, and it was inherited by the predecessors of the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's interesting, uh, if we look at the views of William Miller and his chief lieutenants, Josiah Litch and, Josh and Joshua Himes, who you see here, they all took the view that Millerism did not need to be preached more widely than America. Now, as some of you all know, there were British Millerites, and the late Hugh Dunton, who worked here, uh, wrote an excellent PhD thesis on the British Millerites. But British Millerites arose almost by chance, not because the Millerites wanted to reach out. In fact, just the opposite. Uh, the Millerites took the view that Christianity had already been preached throughout all the world, either by the early church or by the British and American Protestant missionaries operating since about 1800. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But so in their view, the Great Commission has already been fulfilled. And so Millerites don't need to worry about anything that talks about going into all the world. They saw Miller's message as being the last in a series of messages and that it was to be given to those who were most ready to receive it. And Josiah, in case anyone wondered, Josiah Litch made explicit who those were. Thus, he wrote New England being the most pious portion of the earth, would naturally be the theater of the final signs and greatest proclamation. Of course, you have to not only be American, but be from New England, really, to sympathize with this. But you note how he continued, the world has had the midnight cry in proportion to the prevalence of true Christianity in the various portions of the earth. So you receive as much of the midnight cry as you are worthy of hearing. And for the Millerites, this was essentially the northeast of the United States. Now, so these were the attitudes that early Adventists inherited. And so uh, they had, in fact, a skepticism about mission that I think can be almost bewildering to those of us today who are the, the products of a worldwide church. Of course, initially, it's not surprising they didn't think about foreign mission. There were, there were barely any of them, and they were trying to work out their distinctive doctrines. However, by the mid-1850s, this uh, inchoate group of believers is beginning to, to cohere, and they do begin to ask the question about foreign mission. Um, because all American Protestants of this period were extremely well aware of Protestant missionaries, names such as Adoniram Judson, the first missionary to Burma, Hudson Taylor of the China Inland Mission. They also knew of the action of a number of British and American foreign missionary societies and mission boards. These were the subject, these were reported in the mainstream press of the day as well as in the religious press. Uh, and it's partly because of the action of these foreign missionaries that Miller could believe, well, the, the, you know, the Great Commission has already been fulfilled. Uh, and so by the late 1850s, subscribers of the Review and Herald began to inquire whether the Second Advent movement shouldn't, should it not be sending missionaries out beyond America. And let me just briefly digress and say, you know, the importance of the Review and Herald in this period uh, cannot be overstated because until 1863, of course, there is no formal church. What binds all the Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping Adventists together is the Review and Herald. Uh, it is their means of communication. For many, it is actually their sermon because they don't have a minister who regularly attends their church. They may indeed be geographically separated from other Adventists, and so their Sabbath morning devotions consists of reading the articles in the Review and Herald. So the, the fact that we start to see queries of this nature coming to the Review and Herald is telling us that there's some intellectual ferment beginning to happen. In 1859, a man called A.H. Lewis wrote a letter to the editor of the Review in which he asked, is the third angel's message being given or to be given except in the United States? So is the third angel's message being preached in the United States? And indeed, is it supposed to be given? 
outside the United States. The editor, Uriah Smith, published a reply in which he says, we have no information that the third message is at present being proclaimed in any country besides our own. He continued, analogy would lead us to expect that the proclamation of this message would be coextensive with the first angel's message, which means it should be global. So he's saying, yes, analogy might lead us to expect that, but he continued ingeniously, this might not perhaps be necessary to fulfill Revelation 10:11, since our own land is composed of people from almost every nation. So you can preach to all nations without ever leaving the United States of America. It's interesting, by the way, that he cites here Revelation 10:11, and when early Adventists cite prophetic uh, texts about mission until much later, they almost never reference Revelation 14. It's always Revelation 10:11. So that's in the 1859 Review and Herald. But you do notice he says, he doesn't say it's not necessary. He says it might not perhaps be necessary. So he's leaving open the possibility. But the other thing to, to highlight here is that um, this idea that all people can be just reached in the United States. And this is, as we will see, this is an extremely, uh, in, in an idea that lingers and is extremely persistent. Um, and what it means is that if you were, for example, to go and do some research yourself in Adventist periodicals, you have to be careful because when people say, yes, this gospel has to go to all peoples or all nations, they may just mean in the United States. Whereas if they say it has to go into all the world, uh, then it's, uh, th they mean worldwide missions. So you have to be careful and see what kind of rhetoric they're actually using. But there are unquestionably people in the Sabbatarian Adventist ranks who do believe that the mission should go into all the world, not just to the representatives of every people who happen to be living in the States. And of course, even today, there aren't rep truly representatives of every people living in the United States, much less in 1859. This was not uh, this was not a realistic solution to uh, fulfilling the Great Commission even in today, much less 1859. But there are those who think differently, and this is most obviously apparent from the first General Conference Constitution adopted in May 1863, because it includes the provision, as you can see, that the General Conference Executive Committee shall have the special supervision of all missionary labor and as a missionary board shall have the power to decide where such labor is needed and who shall go as missionaries to perform the same. Now, because they use that expression, a missionary board, uh, it gives us an insight into what they're thinking. Because to any Protestant American, it immediately would have conjured up, above all, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, founded in 1810, originally Congregationalist, but very quickly becoming non-denominational, the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Mission, founded in 1837, the Baptist Board of Foreign Mission, founded in 1845, and a range of other missionary societies founded in the 1830s and 1840s. They would have also thought, by the way, of some British missionary societies, including the Baptist Missionary Society, which William Carey had founded. Um, but it, with Mission Board, they're especially going to think of these three mission boards. So the fact that they, that they actually specify in the Constitution that the GC Executive Committee shall act as a mission board is telling us that some of those who draft that Constitution are envisaging that missionaries will be sent not only to the south and to the west coast of the United States, which they regard as mission fields, but also beyond the seas. Because when Americans of the period use missionary board or mission board, that's what they mean. And, very, and we, uh, we know that this is supported by a number of founders of the church because within two months of that founding session of the General Conference, the Review and Herald, which remember is the organ of the church, the flagship journal, published an article entitled The Great Missionary Society by B.F. Snook, who you see pictured. It inclu he include, and he writes passionately about mission and in such terms that makes it plain that it's not just simply to immigrants in America. And he emphasizes that all should desire to be doing what they can in this way. Mission is for all members of the church. 
that Christ's great commission to his disciples was unlimited, requiring that they should preach the gospel everywhere. So not to all people, but everywhere. And he said the same great commission that authorized them to go out into all the world is yet in force. Go and I will go with you is the sentiment of the Lord. And soon after this, James White published an article in which he said, we expect to be sending a missionary to Europe shortly, and it may well be Brother Snook. And yet, as some of you will know, the first official Adventist missionary did not travel abroad until 1874. So what are we to make of the 11 years of hesitancy? Well, first, it was the middle of the American Civil War. So there were a number of important distractions. It makes it difficult for the church. In addition, in 1865, Snook apostatized uh, and sort of in Adventist history goes down legendarily coupled with Brinkerhoff as Snook and Brinkerhoff, uh, who split from the church. The first major schism, well, in the, f the first schism actually of any kind, uh, in the Adventist ranks. And so thereafter, nobody's going to be quoting his article <laughs> as being a good thing to follow. I actually quoted this um, to a, a group of church leaders last year and said, well, nobody's going to quote him approvingly. And somebody shouted out, but you just did. And I said, yes, but it's taken 150 years. Uh, so the fact, you know, that's part of the issue, I think. But I think the real problem is that there was a wider wariness among church leaders, which goes back to the very lack of conviction that actually the church in America needs to be engaged with the church outside America. It is an America-centric point of view. And we know this partly because in 1863 and 1864, church leaders turned down missionaries who offered their services. Now, the first case is an interesting one and a, a strange one, the case of M.B. Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky had been born in Poland. He had been a Franciscan friar. Uh, he abandoned the pre Roman Catholic priesthood, he abandoned the Roman Catholic Church, and he emigrated to the United States where he married. Uh, and there he became a Sabbath keeper. And in 1863, he asked to be sent as a missionary to Europe. He writes very movingly about, he has, you know, he dreams that one day he'd be able to tell the truth of the, the Sabbath and the sanctuary to his fellow Europeans. And he says, you know, send me. But church leaders say, Mm, no, we won't. Now, why not? Well, partly because we know from what happened subsequently that his management of finances was chaotic, and they probably they had a sense of that already because he had been running a mission in New York City, which I'll come back to in a moment. So they knew that he did not have a good grasp of financial management. In effect, too, and I owe this point to, to Harry Leonard, who emphasized it in an excellent essay published a few years ago, he basically abandons his wife and family and there's evidence that his desire to leave his wife and children may have been one reason he was so enthusiastic to go to Europe. So, you know, church leaders probably saw this and were like, well, you know, they, we can sympathize with them. What makes it stranger is that Tchaikovsky then went to the Advent Christian denomination, who were one of the chief rivals of Seventh-day Adventists coming out of Millerites. Advent Christians were ex-Millerites as well. Um, and Tchaikovsky went to them and said, send me to Europe. And so they, they knew he was a Seventh-day Sabbath keeper, but he persuaded them, apparently, of his bona fides. And they did send him to Europe as a missionary for the Advent Christians, where he then proceeded to teach Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. Now, I think probably we might all instinctively sympathize with him, but this is not a model of ethical conduct for missionaries uh, to, to take one denomination's money and preach another's doctrines. So I think with all the evidence, we can say that probably church leaders sensed his flaws and we can be sympathetic with them. Um, Polish uh, Adventists have tended to feel that Tchaikovsky should be honored as the church's real first missionary and um, I think overpraise him basically uh, and sort of imply that you know what fools church leaders were not to send him but I think actually we can sympathize with them and think that they made a reasonable decision. But although lack of confidence in Tchaikovsky may have been justified and would explain why he was not sent, it does not explain why no one was sent to Europe, especially since James White had announced in the review in 1863 that they were planning on sending someone. 
Then in 1864, Hannah Moore and Alexander Dixon, two missionaries already serving in West Africa, wrote to church leaders and they had received Seventh-day Adventist literature. They had been converted. They started keeping the Sabbath and they wrote to church leaders in Battle Creek and said, you know, you don't have to worry about the expense of sending us. Just take us on and we will be missionaries for the Seventh-day Adventists. And again, church leaders said no. So why were the brethren in Battle Creek so reluctant to expand Adventism overseas? I believe there is an ongoing refusal on the part of many American Adventists to accept that biblical phrases like every nation and all the world really meant what they said. But this comes back to this continuing America centrism that somehow America is the most godly part of the world. Uh, it is where things can all be worked out and there is therefore no need really to engage with the rest of the world. And we see evidence of this in a number of places. In 1860, Tchaikovsky, no less, described his work for immigrants in New York City as mission, quote, in foreign nations, because he was working only for immigrants. In 1863, John G. Madison, who you see pictured here, um, wrote to the review expressing his passion that the Adventist message, quote, needs to be carried to the ends of the earth. But he then noted that he hoped to achieve this by working for Scandinavian immigrants to the United States. Madison himself had been born in Denmark, but had emigrated to the United States when he was in his early teens. So even again, you have two Europeans who nevertheless are seeing mission as something that can be done in the United States. In, and in 1865 and 1867, Uriah Smith returns to this theme, and this time there's none of the hesitancy that he expressed in 1859. In 1865, he says, the principal theater of the third angel's message seems to be in our own country. In 1867, he rhapsodizes, in what other land could the proclamation of the, treat, of the truth reach so many peoples, nations, and tongues? Revelation 10, 11. People from every civilized part of the globe are here to be found as a settled and abiding portion of our population. There's no need to go anywhere else. And in 1868, Madison, you remember the man who says, I want to take the third angel's message to the ends of the earth, characterized Revelation 10:11 as, quote, a promise of the kindness and mercy of Jesus to foreigners in the United States. And not till the 1873 General Conference session was the term worldwide used in application to the prophecy of Revelation 10:11. Though then it's used by James White in the keynote address to the conference, and that represents a significant shift, as we'll see in a moment. But it's not till 1873 that anyone says, yes, Revelation 10:11 means outside North America. Now, in 1869, American Adventists discovered that, there, that they were not alone. They discovered that there were groups of practicing Seventh-day Adventists in Europe. Now, how did they come to be there? Some had read Adventist literature, but others Several small groups of believers had been raised up by Tchaikovsky. The thing is, Tchaikovsky, and this is bizarre, did not tell any of his followers that there were Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping Adventists in America. So it's hard to know who was the more shocked to discover that there were other Seventh-day Adventists in the world, the Seventh-day Adventists in America or the Seventh-day Adventists in Europe. But unfortunately, or fortunately, um, Tchaikovsky left, uh, he, he, the church he was working with was in a place called Tramala in Switzerland. And he got itchy feet, as he always did, and said, right, I'm off on another missionary journey. He went off and actually never came back. But he left papers behind. And the two elders of the Tramala church, Jakob Erzberger and Albert Vuillemeyer, both went through his papers and they discovered this paper called the Review and Herald. And to their astonishment, they discover not only are there other Seventh-day Sabbath-keeping Adventists, they actually have an organized church. And they sent Erzberger, who's pictured here, who, was, who it was, had been an elder but then replaced Tchaikovsky as their pastor, they sent him to the United States. And he actually attended the 1869 General Conference session and was ordained at a camp meeting the following summer. So you'd think once you actually not only have news of other Adventists, of European Adventists, but a European Adventist moving among you, you'd think attitudes would change. But it wasn't so. That same year, James White issued an appeal in the Review and Herald for donations for money to help the Swiss Adventists. But the response was not enthusiastic. And in 
That was in the summer of 1869. By January of 1870, he says, our people very slowly respond to the call for means to help the cause in Switzerland. We have been disappointed. Well, why? Uh, he suggested three main reasons. You see them summarized there, but just to give you some more details, he noticed he noted that few Adventists had money, and among those who wanted to help, many had no money to spare. But then he said, most of those brethren who have ready cash have neither seen their duty to help the cause in all its departments or have lost the spirit of sacrifice. And it's notable here when he says, help the cause in all its departments, Really, he's, what he's implying here, I think, is going beyond our little heartland of Adventism in New England, upstate New York, and the Midwest. And he said there was a third group, and he said, in the minds of many, there is some doubt. For those who are ready to hand out money to circulate publications in our own country and to help the cause in our own land, to risk their money to help the cause in Europe does not look so clear. So the real issue is that Adventists did not yet agree that they had a responsibility to help the work abroad. America first remained the mindset. And this uh, was to continue. It's interesting, at the 1871 General Conference session, the session passed a resolution that says, we resolve to send Brother Madison as a missionary to the Danes and Norwegians. So you might think, well, okay, they've finally taken the plunge. But that wasn't the end of the resolution. It had two other words of Wisconsin. <laughs> and as some of you will know, Wisconsin is, had a heavy and still has a heavy population of people of Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish extraction. So they weren't sending him as a missionary to Scandinavia, they were sending him as a missionary to Wisconsin. Now, they also passed another resolution which they said, we will work among foreigners in our own land where we may reach them without the labor and expense of foreign mission work. And it said, this is one of the most efficient means of spreading to other lands a message which is to go to many nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples. Sort of if you say it often enough, it obviates the need to do anything about it. Um, and of course, there is a point to this. By converting foreign immigrants, there is the chance that they will go back to their homelands and be very effective missionaries. And in fact, that, that did happen. But nevertheless, the idea that this is the way to take the message to many nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples is a strange one. They also pass another resolution in which they say, we give all the glory to God for the existence of a, a church in Switzerland. And really, that's fair enough, because they hadn't had anything to do with it. John N. Andrews actually writes as much in an editorial in the Review and Herald, basically says, well, we cannot look on the existence of these brethren in Switzerland with any degree of satisfaction because we haven't had anything to do with it. So even in 1871, two years after Erzberger comes to the GC session, those Adventists who wanted to consolidate the work in America seem to have won the debate. 1873 is finally a turning point, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, and Harry Leonard has explored some of them in the, the essay I mentioned earlier. But a key moment is actually, I think, that Albert Vuillemier and two other Swiss leaders wrote a letter to the GC in which they actually said, you know, we really need help. We pray you to consider under the regard of God if it will not be necessary to send an American messenger to Europe to direct the propagation of the truth. So they're not just saying we need financial help, we need literature. They're saying, no, we need an American messenger to help us propagate the truth. Oh, dear brethren, pray for us and for the work in Europe. This is the earnest prayer of your affectionate brethren in Jesus Christ who renew to you the assurance of their Christian love. And you see here, Albert Vuillemier and his small daughter. And, you know, this is, this is like the man from Macedonia saying, please come over and help us. What can you, how can you respond? And at the 1873 GC session, James White stresses that the Adventist message has to go to all peoples. This is, in fact, the chief conference address. It's the beginning address. It gets published as the conference address in the Review and Herald. And he keeps coming back to the need that the message has to go to all peoples. He talks about all peoples or worldwide or all the world 14 times in that one address. And he specifically says, yes, we need good translations in our own country, but my friends, they need them in Europe and they must have them there. All that is necessary is action on our part. 
And so 15 years after Uriah Smith answered that first letter, 11 years after the church was founded, on September 15, 1874, John N. Andrews sailed from Boston for Europe. Now, it's interesting, he's, he's not the, on, the only, he's always said this is the first official missionary, but actually we should honor the three missionaries who went because his wife, uh, Angeline, who you see here, had died just two years before and Andrews took his two young children, Charles and Mary. Mary was to die of tuberculosis contracted while in Europe as her father was as well. Uh, so th these are the sacrifices that were required. But they went as the first foreign missionaries. Now, this is the way that event is commemorated in a statue at Andrews University named after Andrews, showing he and his two children in heroic pose. And I show you this because I do think it actually captures something uh, and something not entirely to Andrew's credit, which is, yes, here we are, the American heroes going to save the benighted of Europe. Andrews was to make several short trips back to the States, but he remained in Europe, the leader of the Adventist work in Europe until his death in October 1883. A death uh, that was, the proximate cause was tuberculosis, but I mean the fundamental cause was underwork and probably malnutrition because even though he was sent good sums of money uh, from America, he poured it all into the work and subsisted on an entirely inadequate diet. And so one can admire, I admire, one can not only can one admire, I admire Andrews for his dedication and his self-sacrifice. But I do think it's a problem that Andrews went consciously as an heroic helper um, to lead, not to learn. He went to lead the Adventist work. He went to help. You know, come over to Macedonia and help us. Yes, I will come and help you. I will do things for you and to you. And I think there's the wider problem of what I've been trying to sketch out for you, which is that American Adventists came with this mindset that America was more godly than Europe, and also that Americans, well, we are already very familiar with immigrants from Europe. We already know everything we need to know about how you're going, how you work, and, and, and how things will work in Europe. And this is a problem for the next 10 years. Now, let's be fair to Andrews. Of course, Ellen White, some of you will know Ellen White's view of him. She writes, he was the ablest man in our ranks. She actually writes to rebuke European Adventists for not valuing him enough, said, we sent you the ablest man in our ranks. Andrews, it's probably not widely known, had been general conference president for two years. He was the chief theologian of the Seventh-day Sabbath and had contributed to our theology on a range of other issues. He had been editor of the Review and Herald. And in fairness to him, while he was in Europe, work was started in Switzerland and Germany in 1874, France in 1876, Denmark in 1877, Norway and England in 1878, Incidentally, Madison gets his wish. It's Madison who is sent uh, to Scandinavia. And in fact, in Egypt in 1879 and Sweden and Italy in 1880. And of course, Andrews didn't do all this by himself. He had the help of pioneering missionaries. And what's interesting is uh, that a number of them had, and these are the most successful, had some kind of cross-cultural experience or background. There was the young Ludwig R. Conradi, who had been born in Germany, but had emigrated to America as a young man uh, and become a dynamic Adventist preacher, but was sent back to help Andrews and eventually replaced him. There was Madison. There were the two Bordeaux brothers, Augustine and Daniel, who were from Canadians, but they were from Quebec and they were French speaking. There were other missionaries too. And in fact, one of them included Ellen White. Uh, this is the first Adventist camp meeting in Europe held at Moss in Norway in 1887. And the little lady here with the blue arrow, that's Ellen White, who was the featured speaker. Ellen White actually spent more than a year in Europe. But having noted Andrew's successes during the early years of Adventist mission to Europe, key mistakes were made. Adventism was too American and did not adapt enough to the local context. This was true firstly in leadership style, but it was also true in missional methodologies. And the first problem in leadership style was Andrew's own leadership style. 
He ha very harshly criticised local European converts for failing to live up to Adventist lifestyle standards. And he actually wrote in the review, I need to bring the Swiss brethren up to the standard of the work in America. Now, he wrote that in the review, but there's no doubt that the locals were aware of his opinion of them, that they needed to be brought up to a local standard. And a lot of this did revolve not around doctrine, but around lifestyle issues. And Andrews is forgetting the fact that, you know, when he had first become an Adventist, his diet was not an exemplary Adventist diet, as he himself writes. These are people who've just been converted, and he seems to have no sympathy for the fact that they're being asked to make quite substantial lifestyle adjustments um, over the space of a, a few months, whereas he and the other Adventist leaders had done it over the space of a, f a few years much earlier. And I think Andrews failed to recognize that mission is not only a process of transplanting truths or transplanting organizations or importing standard methods from one culture to another. He never really grasped that. And Ellen White was one who recognized this and rebuked him, in particular saying, you should have done less yourself, because part of his problem was that he regarded everyone else is being inadequate, so he had to do everything. I think not only was he the ablest man in all our ranks, but he was probably too aware that he was the ablest man in all our ranks. Ellen White wrote, let every man who can work. The best general is not the one who does most of the work himself, but one who will obtain the greatest amount of labor from others. Andrews did not effectively make the sum of the parts greater than the whole. There has not been one-tenth done, she said, in Europe that could have been accomplished had the efforts been more general and more extended. And the problem is with Andrews himself, who is keeping everything focused on himself. After Andrews' death, things changed. He was replaced by L.R. Conradi, who was still quite young. And it's interesting to, con to note some of the things Conrad did. In 1886, he set up a training school for coal porters in Basel, in Switzerland. In 1889, he created a missionary training school as part of the church headquarters building in Hamburg, and 10 years later founded the first European SDA seminary, which was in Friedensau, Germany, and is still, of course, the premier Adventist training center in Germany today, and I believe the accreditor of the Newbold uh, theological degrees. And Con, the, the proof of this is in that Conradi actually mentored and fostered the, the emergence of a number of important denominational leaders. Just two I can mention whose names are probably mostly forgotten today, but W.K. Ising and O.H. Schubert, who both later had a global role. So Andrews doesn't really bring along anyone else. All those people I mentioned got sent to him from Europe, and people like Madison basically worked completely independently uh, of Andrews. Conradi brings along an interesting generation. So thus far, on, that's briefly on leadership issues, but also there were mistakes in methods. Uh, and something I'm going to touch on now, some of you have heard before, but many of you have not. So uh, I will trespass uh, on the indulgence of those of you who have heard this before. Uh, Ellen White herself wrote that there is the greatest need of the work in new fields starting right. She says, there is great importance attached to the starting in right at the beginning of your work. And she says, this is uh, in 1887, I have been shown that the work in England is not making that decided advancement that it might have made if the work had commenced right. The problem was importing American methods without reflection. Now, Jay and Andrews, from experience, concluded in 1878 that there was no point in using tents for mission in Switzerland, I'm tempted to say something about the Swiss being extremely plutocratic and certain values, but I won't say that just in case there's any Swiss in the room. Um, but he also wrote in 1880 to reach the middle and upper classes in Britain to any great extent, it is necessary to hire respectable halls because the British too are plutocratic and in Britain also class obsessed and to have a big tent in Britain is redolent of the fair and not of high class activities. The problem was that the leader of Adventist mission in Britain was John N. Loughborough. Now to be fair to Loughborough, he and M. E. Cornell in the 1850s were the men who introduced that staple of Adventist evangelism, the big tent. 
and they had tremendous success with it. This actually, these show you, these are contemporary images of tent missions. This is an artist's impression. You can just hopefully at the back even see the, the preacher gesticulating, giving an impassioned sermon. And this is an actual photograph of an evangelistic meeting in a big tent from the early 1850s. So, you know, for Loughborough, from his point of view, um, using a big tent is an obvious thing to do. He had used them with great success in the Midwest and on the West Coast of the United States. So he arrives in England and has his first evangelistic meeting on the South Coast of England, but uh, is to discover that the old world and the new world were different. But to be fair to him, he was doing something that he thought would work. And also, even though Andrews had said, look, you need to rent these respectable halls, Loughborough looks at the cost and says, well, there's really not enough money. I can rent a big tent for much, much less than that, and I think it will be successful. And the other point is that in the Midwest and the West Coast, Loughborough had reached people of all social classes. And I think he just genuinely believes that he can do the same in Britain. But not so. Ellen White writes in 1887, great wisdom is required to be exercised in the matter of how the truth is brought before the people. And writing of Britain specifically, she says, if the plans and methods had been of a different character, even if they necessarily involved more outlay of means, there would have been far better results. The work in old England might have been much farther advanced than now than it is if our brethren had not moved in so cheap a way. If they had hired good halls and carried forward the work as they, although they had great truths which would be victorious, then the work would have advanced more than it has. <coughs> and yet I reflect reading this that uh, every year in the 1990s and the 2000s up to the point where we left England, there was a report in the messenger of a big tent being used for evangelism somewhere in England. Conradi, however, when he took over, began to dress Adventism in European clothes. Well, what does that mean? In his public addresses, especially in Germany, both to Adventist audiences and non-Adventists, he repeatedly argued that Adventism in Europe, if one viewed it historically, that Adventism was not now on foreign soil, it was actually on its native soil, because he emphasizes Adventism comes out of the Reformation. And the volume of essays, uh, Heirs to the Reformation, which was published uh, quite a few years ago now, I guess, by Stamborough Press, is actually the latest manifestation of that thinking, emphasizing that Adventism has its roots in Reformation theology, not in America. One German uh, Adventist leader, F. Dombrowski, who was a student at Friedenshour in the first decade of the 20th century, recalled, we young students were impressed by Conradi's often speaking of a homegrown Adventism. He tried to prove that most of our doctrines were to be found much earlier in Europe than in North America. So emphasizing, for example, the Seventh-day Sabbath keeping uh, of Karlstadt, Luther's contemporary, who was actually condemned by Luther for it, emphasizing the Anabaptists and the tradition of baptism by immersion. Uh, these are the kinds of things that Conradi liked to focus on. And as this was actually the focus of his book, Das Golden Zeit Alter, The Golden Age in 1923, which is all about showing how Adventist doctrines really emerged in Germany in the Reformation. And it's interesting that in America, as a young minister, Conradi had preached about Adventism's distinct doctrines. In effect, he used public evangelism to distinguish Adventism from other denominations, and in fact, to, to emphasize that, to emphasize its separateness. But in Germany, and then in Russia, where Conradi worked very widely amongst German-speaking, uh, ethnic German communities in Russia with great success, he used public evangelism or public preaching in a different way. Instead, he used it to break down prejudices. Instead, he would refer to a mutual historical and theological inheritance and his intent being to remove the prejudices of European people against what they saw as being this import, this upstart import from the United States of America. 
And so this is what the service, this is what public meetings served for him. The main work of winning souls mostly took place on a smaller scale. It was done by coal porters and by Bible studies. And Adventists actually deliberately adopted both the, the, the form and the title of something that was distinct to German pietism, the Bibelstund, a Bible study group. They called them that and they used those as the primary mode of Adventist mission in Central and Eastern Europe. And again, the intention was to say Adventism is quite like pietism. It's not something alien. It's something that fits very well with German culture. The distinguished German Adventist historian Daniel Heinz concludes by pointing out that although the Adventist movement is a North American phenomenon, its beliefs have roots that go back to pietism, Adventists in Germany succeeded in strengthening their own confessional identity. And the result was remarkable growth in Europe. In 1883, on Andrew's death, there were 17,436 Seventh-day Adventists around the world. But almost all of them were in North America. 16,942 were in North America. There were 223 in the whole of Central Europe. By 1914, the beginning of the First World War, there were over 125,000 Adventists worldwide. 72,000 were in North America, but 35,146 were in the European division. Of those, just over 13,000 were in Germany itself, but nearly 25,000 were in the German, Austrian, and Russian empires, and virtually all of those in Russia were German-speaking. And in fact, the East German Union Conference was the sixth largest union in the world. Its 7,177 members actually made it larger than seven of the 12 unions then in North America. So basically, under Conradi's leadership, membership in Europe had increased 15,700% in 31 years. The growth rate was greater than in North America. But part of the story is not just Conradi, it's also that American leaders were also taking a different view. And my time is virtually gone, but I'll just quickly go through some striking statements that show the way that American attitudes were changing. The first is from a letter from J.S. Washburn to Ellen White. Washburn was a missionary to Britain, and actually when he first arrived, he was writing things rather similar to Andrew's about, you know, need to bring the local converts up to American standards. But by 1892, he writes to Ellen White, we like the work here very much indeed, and have no desires to go back to the U.S. except to see our friends and relatives. This country seems home to me now. A.T. Jones gave an address to the 1897 General Conference session which had the title Missionaries for God. Now, Jones never served as a long-term missionary, but at this point he had just come back from a trip of several months through Europe and the Middle East visiting Adventist mission sites, and he wanted to share with church leaders the wisdom he had gained, which he shared in typically uh, trenchant form. The Lord, he said, wanted Abraham to be a missionary to all people whom he should meet up afterwards on the earth, and he was that. But God knew that no man can be a missionary who has a country in this world. You and I cannot be a missionaries in any other country if America is our country. We cannot be missionaries in America as long as America is our country. So not only can you not be missionaries abroad, you can't even be missionaries in America if you're too focused on your national identity. You cannot even be a missionary at home if you have not first got out of your country. Why are we sent to be missionaries? Missionaries of what? What is our mission work? What is the object of it? Are we missionaries for America or missionaries for God? Is America God's country? It is not good enough. And it is not good enough for God's people, however good it is. You and I are to be missionaries for God to all people unto God, to call them from sin unto righteousness, from darkness unto light, from the country where they are into the better country which God has prepared. Now, this idea of having any country in this world works just this way. With reference to countries, that country that is yours is the leading thing in your mind. And if you go to another country, you will constantly be drawing comparisons between that country and your own. The lessons that you give the sermons that you preach, the very influence that accompanies you will be so tinctured with it unconsciously to yourself 
but the people will recognize it all the time. There is a barrier between you and them that you never can get over until you get out of your country. And here, of course, he means metaphorically, not just physically. Your work cannot be effective until that barrier is broken down between you and the people and they see that you are separated from your country, your kindred and your father's house. But when you have got out of your country, when you have been born again, your nativity, your citizenship is in the heavenly country. Then there will be no barrier between you and anybody on this earth and you can take the gospel to every man in this world. Also, uh, four years later to the 1901 General Conference session in Battle Creek, William Spicer gave a talk called The Necessary Preparation for Mission Work. Now, it's true that Spicer had served uh, in India, but actually the, Spicer's longest period of service abroad had been in Britain. This shows him, you see him here, second from left, with Doris Robinson, who by this time was the leader of the British mission, around 1890 with workers at the British church headquarters. He actually served in Britain from 1888 to 92, and then again from 94 to 98. I like this picture. This shows the staff of the, this was the British Adventist Publishing House. It was called the International Track Society at 451 Holloway Road, London, which is now um, a, a, a sort of um, a place that does greasy fish and chips. But they're quite nice, I've eaten there. Uh, and so this is the British publishing house. You can see Spicer there in the middle. So yes, Spicer goes to India. You see him here again with Doris Robinson uh, and the local, the American and local staff of the so-called Bow Bazaar mission in Calcutta. But most of Spicer's experience up to 1901 has been in England. And I believe therefore that this is what he is reflecting when he talks, when he speaks. He's reflecting his experience in Europe. That thought of Americanism, of nationalism, is something to reckon with. I am an American. I'm not ashamed of it, but I'm not proud of it. And I want to tell you, I'm not sure that there's any American church leader today who would address an audience of American Adventists and say, I'm not, have to say, well, I'm not ashamed of it, because they would never imagine that it was possible. But this was a different era. I am not ashamed of it, but I am not proud of it. And that makes all the difference in the world in being able to help people outside of America. For you take any man who is proud of the fact that he is an American and he has erected a barrier between himself and every soul who is not an American. Anybody who has been in a foreign field, which Spicer has, but remember for most of it, it's the English field. Anybody who has been in a foreign field has known this fact. Difficulties which perhaps it has taken years to clear away have been created by those who kept that national spirit forward. That thing is so drilled into men that it clings to the heart. It was sometimes taught us in our school histories of the United States. It was worked into us and made our hearts thrill with the fighting spirit. That same spirit keeps on thrilling in minds and hearts even after men have taken up the word of God and have gone out into foreign fields. The Lord wants to take that spirit out of our hearts. We read in the first chapter of John, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was sent from God. It makes all the difference in the world whether a man is sent from God or whether he is sent from America or from some other land. You find this spirit of nationalism in all lands. In every nation, you will find that same national conceit. And every man feels like praising and glorifying his country. But oh, let us be sent from God. That is the way Jesus came on his mission. He knew he was come from God and he could say, he that, is sent, he that sent me is with me. It does no one good to take along from America a national feeling into the fields. But if you can be sent from God and can say, he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, you've got something a good deal closer to you than America. When Jesus knew he was sent from God and went to God, he knew something we need to know too. Too many are sent from America and they go to America. We want to be sent from God and to have God's house as our home. And here's the thing, minutes of GC sessions in those days are very complete and they include the interjections from the audience and we know from the minutes that at this point our men's were ringing around the hall. And again, I doubt such a speech would be greeted with fervent amens from an American audience today. In by 1901, American missionary to England, Homer R. Salisbury, after, and we stand in the hall named after him, 
Salisbury was known amongst English church members for being, as one of them wrote, somewhat acquainted with the conditions and way of the English people, which made his presence very acceptable. You notice the distinctive English understatement in saying somewhat acquainted. But at least it made him more acceptable. And in 1902, a year later, Guy Dale, an American missionary who was then serving as secretary of the German Union, wrote that missionaries on arriving in the field needed to reach a mutual understanding with our newly acquired neighbors. So the attitudes have completely changed from saying we go as heroic people to save and help and have to draw them up to our standards to saying, no, we need to understand, we need to live amongst them. And so both European leaders and American leaders have a different set of attitudes and it's not surprising they have a different set of methodologies. So why did things change? And here we draw to a conclusion. There are a variety of reasons. First, the German church split as the result of the First World War. It's interesting, <clears throat> in this year that commemorates the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War, in Britain, church leaders and young Adventist men were arrested and brutally treated because they refused to bear arms, because they regarded that as being distinctively Adventist. In Germany, uh, church leaders encouraged young men to enlist. Uh, church halls were made into recruiting stations. And this was Conradi's doing because part of what Conradi did was actually to, was to achieve a rapprochement between the church and German political leaders. Actually, Conradi was extremely clever. Uh, he works out that in Britain, there's a separate colonial service to the home civil service, but in, in Germany at the time, there was just one civil service. And so you might be detached to be the governor of Samoa uh, or the governor of the Caroline Islands in the Central Pacific or of Shanghai, or the, rather the German possession near Shanghai, and then for two years and then a few years later come back to Germany. So he used Adventist mission presence in the German colonies where Europeans were few, you know, and Americans, you could all say, well, we're all Westerners together. And so these colonial officials would come back to Germany with very warm opinions of the Adventist church. Never happened in Britain. Uh, such documentation as we have actually shows that British colonial service officials tend to regard Adventists with a lot of suspicion. But in Germany, no. And so the German church works closely with German state officials. And so naturally, when the war breaks out, the church becomes very supportive of the state. And some German Adventists, though, are aware of Adventist history and say, no, this is wrong. And so the German church splits, and the split between the Adventist church and the Reform Adventists still exists today, though the Reform Adventists are probably dying out. But uh, the church split. And partly as a result of that, Conradi himself was operating in a different environment in the 1920s. And it's a good question as to why it happened, but we know that by 1932, he left the church. He defected. He became a Seventh-day Baptist. And in his late 80s, he was still evangelizing, but now for Seventh-day Baptists in Germany. My own suspicion is that it was partly the fact that his attitudes to military service had split the church in Germany. But I think also, by the 1920s, there's a new generation of Adventist church leaders um, who probably don't, tr Americans that is, who probably don't treat Conradi with the respect that he thinks he deserves. Uh, and there's a clash of personalities. Probably some of the American church leaders feel actually that Conradi needs to be eased out. Conradi didn't want to be eased out. And the result was increasing disaffection and finally defection. Then of course you have the rise of totalitarian dictatorships in the 1930s in Europe. And the net result is that in the 30s, European Adventism became reliant on funding and missionaries from the United States to an extent it had not been since the 1880s. And then you have the Second World War, mass destruction, mass disruption, and again, for the church to be revitalized, it needs American money and it needs American missionaries. And I kind of feel that in some ways, perhaps, uh, the great George Vanderman campaign in London in the early 1950s is a coda to this, uh, because it was tremendously successful. And I know people here were brought into the church through that campaign. But it was really saying, let's adopt an American method and really 
embrace it fully. Uh, and it worked, but it was not a long-term alternative. So to the question, are we here Seventh-day Europeans? Um, it's a good question. But I do think historically we can't say that the church in Europe has been run by Americans in an American way because that's not the case. In its early years, yes, it's true. But for a prolonged period from the mid-1880s through to, I think, the early to mid-1930s, the church in Europe was run by Europeans along distinctively European lines. And what is striking is that in that period, the church did enjoy considerable growth. Whether there are lessons this offers for the 21st century is a good question, but I will only offer analysis of historical issues rather than become a prophet because historians are very bad prophets. <laughs>